Hello, and welcome to On the Marie Curie Couch, the podcast that aims to break down taboos and start open, honest conversations about death and dying. I'm Jason Davidson. I'm a social worker by profession, and I've worked in palliative care, hospice care, and bereavement support services for more than a decade. Each episode, we're going to be speaking to a well-known guest to find out about how they feel about their own mortality and how their personal experience of bereavement has shaped the way they live their life. Today, I'm on the Marie Curie couch with Paul Chuckle. Born Paul Elliott in Rotherham in 1947, entertainer Paul made his name as one half of the Chuckle Brothers alongside his beloved brother, Barry. Their BBC children's TV series, Chuckle Vision, ran for 22 years and gave rise to the much repeated, to me, to you, catchphrase. The pair enjoyed success on stage and screen for more than 50 years until Barry's death in August 2018. Paul has a passion for DJing and he lives in Doncaster with his wife, Sue. I'll be talking to Paul today via video call. Welcome to the Marie Curie Couch. Thank you, Jason. Can I begin today, Paul, by asking you if you could tell us about a significant death or deaths that you've experienced in your life? Well, I I have had a lot of grief and and losses in my life, Um, not just Barry. Uh, but back in 1974, uh, when I was married the first time round, I lost uh, a baby girl, at three months old, just over three months old. Uh, that was awful. We had her at home for six weeks. Perfect, beautiful little girl. Then uh, the doctors found a slight problem in her tummy. Uh, we had to take her down to the hospital and they kept her in for six, seven weeks until she passed away. That really, really hurt. The pain there, imagine I was only... 27 years old um, you know and to lose a little baby girl I, I still get upset now when I go to uh, to the grave see a little grave there you know uh, and then I lost my dad in the 80s uh, my mother in 1999 and every time you lose anybody the actual pain in your chest but most of your body hurts it's a physical pain uh, which you need to get rid of by crying you know, let it out. Don't don't shut it in. Let it out. It's the only way of getting rid of the pain. And it is a physical pain. I lost my sister then. Um, my sister Sheila, she passed away about 2007. Lost my brother Colin. He, he passed away about four years after. Uh, then Barry was next. Uh, I think everybody knows who Barry is. That was probably, apart from my daughter, was the biggest, the biggest hit I've ever had. Because obviously he was there, I'm three years younger than he is. And he's been there all my life since I was born. And then when I left school at 15, we went straight into showbiz and uh, worked ever since from 1963 to 2018. So that is going to be a big wrench from your life, which it is. And I still miss him every day, obviously, but um, you get over that hurt, that, that pain. The missing someone never goes. You know, you never lose that. And then a year later, Jimmy, my eldest brother, died. There's only Brian and myself left uh, of uh, the whole family. Uh, apart from kids and grandkids, obviously, they're still around. Uh, thankfully and gladly. Um, it's, uh, but the, the actual pain of losing people, it's the same every time. It doesn't get any better. You know, and don't expect it to get better. It's uh, You lose somebody close to you. It hurts. It really physically hurts. But... The only way to get round it, because it does go eventually, the pain goes, is to talk to people, grieve. Don't be, I'm a Rotherham man, I don't cry. You know, let it out of you. It's like steam having a lid on something. Take the lid off, let the steam out. It's the same crying, lets that physical pain out. You know, it's a tough life, but it's that is part of life, living, dying. And we have to live with it, you know. So how did Barry die? Was it a illness he'd had for a long time or was it quite short? He had it for a couple of years, but I didn't know till about six, seven weeks before he died. 
he'd got these pains in his legs, you know, mainly one leg. And the pain he was telling me it was sounded very much like sciatica because I had it years ago and it's very painful. You can't sit down for too long. And I thought it was that. And he said, uh, yeah, the doctor said it's sciatica. But then he, both legs um, started pain. I said, are you sure it's sciatica? Because that doesn't sound right, having sciatica down both legs. Yeah, that's what they tell me. Yeah. And I said, well, you know, your doctors know best. But what he wasn't telling me was that he'd got bone cancer. Then eventually one day, I got a phone call from Anne, his wife, to say he can't get out of bed. And I said, what do you mean can't get out of bed? He said he's tried and his legs just gave way on him, couldn't stand. So um, I went round to see him and uh, that's when he told me that it was bone cancer he'd got. And I said, you know, why didn't you tell me before? And uh, obviously I knew the reason why. He wanted to work until he died. He wanted, he wanted to die on stage, preferably like Tony Cooper did. He just loved entertaining people. Um, and he really got his wish because uh, in his wheelchair, he did uh, the voiceovers for the last bit of uh, Chuckle Time, which is Channel 5 series we were doing. And the trooper he was, he came to my house and the sound people came up. And we did all the sound bits, you know, while he was in the wheelchair. So that he did really work right to the finish. And he got that out of the way done. And then he just went down so quickly at the end. You know, it was, it was awful to see. I saw him on the Wednesday. I missed out a couple of days. So I was up in Scotland doing a TV show. And when I got back, went to see him on the Saturday. It was, it was really, really bad way. You know, it really gone downhill. So I spent a couple of hours with him and I said, I'll see you in the morning, Baz. Uh, went home. Um, they got a phone call at quarter past seven in the morning from his wife, Anne, said he'd just passed away. The nice thing about it was the Marie Curie nurses were looking after him. You know, we've been ambassadors for many years and uh, he didn't know there were Marie Curie nurses, but the, the hospice at Rotherham, he didn't want to go in, he wanted to be at home. And they supplied him a bed at home and the Marie Curie nurses came out, you know, daily to look after him. And it was just nice that they were there for him at the end, you know. So Barry was, he knew about his diagnosis and he was ill for quite a while, but he, he like you were saying, he didn't want to talk with you about it because he knew you would be talking with him about possible treatment options. Exactly. And he knew if he'd have told me or told our manager, Phil, we'd have straight away said, get it sorted, you know, and they'd say, well, what about summer season, you know? So get the summer season, we'll cancel it, you know. Your health's more important. And that wasn't something he wanted. He wanted to carry on working. He just loved entertaining people, making people laugh, which is what he did brilliantly, I think. He'll be forever missed, you know, not just by me, but millions of other people, I think. Going back to the day where he did tell you, where you went round to his house, you know, and he couldn't get out of the bed. Why do you think he told people at that point? Well, he'd already told his close family, you know, his kids knew, his grandkids knew, his wife knew. Uh, I think my older brothers knew, but he, he had them all under a thing saying, whatever you do, don't let Paul know. And of course, when, once he did tell me, it was far too late. There was nothing they could do then. I wonder if there was uh, something about protecting you from that information as well. Possibly, but I, I think 100% it was because he knew, you know, we would force him to go and get some treatment. You know, he wouldn't have chemotherapy, he wouldn't have uh, radiotherapy, he wouldn't have anything. And he always did say years ago that he, he couldn't understand why people would go through all that pain and sickness and stuff of chemotherapy when they've already been told that there's not much chance. I said, there's always a chance, you know. My wife, Sue... She's had cancer three times. She's still with us, you know. So, okay, it's not nice having the chemotherapy. You get sickness, you get not feeling well, but it's, it's all about staying here, you know. He could have still been with us, you know. He could well have still been with us. We don't know. But then again, it was his choice. So how did his decision make you feel? Uh, well, to me, whoever, whoever you are, whatever you want to do in life, it's your choice. You know, I'm the kind of person that doesn't regret anything I've ever done in my life. And I don't think anyone should regret anything they've done. 
in hindsight, maybe you could say, I wish I hadn't done that, but you did it. And if you went back to that time again, you'd make that same choice again. Which is why I always say, never regret anything you've ever done because it's pointless. So once it was out in the open that Barry's illness was terminal and it was bone cancer, um, what kind of conversations, if any, did you and Barry have about life and death or dying? Well, we, we often used to talk about it when we were touring and stuff, and, uh, but he never believed in the afterlife. We had so many conversations about it, which I've always believed in the afterlife. And um, so we didn't really talk about, you know, when, once we knew, and I'd go and visit him and he'd be sitting in his chair outside, nice sunny weather, obviously summer. And, um, you know, we didn't really talk about him going. You know, it was inevitable. Uh, he, he kept saying uh, things like, when, when I do go, you know, I want you to carry on in the business. Cause I, he said, I know what you like. You'll probably say, no, without Barry, you know, I can't do it. But he said, you can. Um, so that, that was one of the things he, he you know, he made me do. Well, he didn't make me do, but he, he advised me to carry on and what have you. And uh, I'm very glad I did, you know. And uh, whenever I'm on stage, I can feel him beside me. He's there. I know, I know there's an afterlife and I know he's there. The very f first night he'd, he'd passed away, he came back to me in a dream. And almost every night since, whenever I have a dream, Barry's always there, he's beside me somewhere or he's in the background. He's, oh, and that to me is his way of saying, Paul, there is an afterlife. You were right, you know. And as I say, going on stage, I'll stand in the wings because, you know, all my life I've gone on stage with Barry beside me or I'd, I'd enter one side of the stage and the opposite, you know, we'd meet in the middle. Um, and that first time I went on doing pantomime on my own, you know, as I stood there, I was fine. No, not nervous or anything, I'd got it all rehearsed. And uh, just the last minute before the music played, I suddenly thought, you know, this is the first time I've been on without Barry, you know, and I'm sure he patted me on the back. So he would say, come on, I'm behind you, Paul. And I felt that and I walked on and I, and I worked bang straight through the whole routine, you know, knowing he was, he was there. How lovely. It's great. And he's been there ever since. It is fabulous. It really is. That's so nice. So it, you did have some conversations and I think he obviously was able to, like you described, say some of, express some of his wishes for you in the future when, when he died. And um, it also sounds like you were saying earlier about his wish to die at home and not go into the hospice. So um, had he expressed his wishes about his care and death, but also had he made any plans for his funeral, do you know? I don't know that it was uh, Anne, his wife Anne, you know, he would have talked to her about it all. Because obviously people always thought that Barry and I lived together <laughs> because of Chuckle Vision, you know, everything, we're always together. Um, we always worked together, we travelled together, stayed in all the same hotels together. And everything. We were always there together, but his private life and my private life were completely apart, you know what I mean? Yes. Barry had his wife, his kids and his grandkids. I have my wife, my kids and grandkids. So when we're not working, which was maybe 12, 14 weeks a year, mm. then we'd have our own lives apart. We'd just talk on the phone or chat or whatever, you know, when we met at the football match or something like that. So he would have had those conversations with Anne. With Anne, about, yeah. yeah about, about his wishes and about his funeral. And um, was the funeral local to where he, he'd lived? Yeah, it was, it was a fabulous day because... Um, he died on the Sunday and the following Saturday because we were life presidents of Rotherham United, honorary life presidents. So we used to go to the, the match, the home games when we weren't working. Well, he, he obviously couldn't go for the last you know, couple of months or so. The Saturday after he passed away, Rotherham were at home to Ipswich Town and um, I went to the match and you know, they were all condolences and what have you. They did a two minutes applause, the whole crowd you know, before the game, which was a surprise to me, they hadn't told me. It was just lovely. And then on the 73rd minute, they all started um, applauding again, shouting from one end of the stadium to the other, to me, to you, to me, to you, and then go, one Barry Chuckle, there's only one Barry Chuckle. 
it's well built, well up in my eyes, you know, straight away. It was really good. That's the tractor boys from uh, Ipswich and the Rotherham United fans. You know, the whole crowd all singing about Barry. That must have been pretty special. Oh, it was. 73rd minute because he's, uh, he was 73, you know. Okay. And then um, the funeral was at, well, again, he wasn't religious, Barry. So uh, he had a, not, not a parson, not a vicar, uh, somebody who, who does that sort of thing. And they did it at, at New York Stadium. Rotherham United, the ground, and uh, the funeral procession went from his house. And as we we're heading in towards Rotherham, a police car came out in front of the hearse. And we thought, you know, it's, it's ch- it jumped out in front of them. You don't usually go in front of a, a car, sir. but it led us right through the town. As we got into Rotherham, people all over the streets clapping as we went past, and then into the stadium. They were packed, the car park was packed with people and they were all cheering and clapping us as we drove in. Uh, really, really nice. Great send-off he had, fabulous send-off. I just love that kind of cheering and clapping as well because you don't often put the two things together, do you? You know, funerals and cheering and clapping. Um, how great. It's more of a modern thing, isn't it? Rather than um, all crying and sobbing, you know, everybody appreciates the life that that he's had and to, to applaud and to cheer and say you know great stuff well done sorry you've gone but celebrate your life not your death you know which is it's a great theory great theory the coronavirus pandemic has triggered a wave of bereavement across the country and taken away our ability to be with loved ones and grieve in traditional ways Marie curie's new memory cloud is an online space to reflect on a loved one's life and share special memories with your friends and family. Visit memorycloud.org.uk Can you tell us what it's been like, your grief since Barry's died? As I say, it's it's the same when anybody close to you dies. It's it's a physical pain, it really is. Um, Obviously, I cried a lot, hell of a lot, uh, and that's a good thing. And the more you do that, the better you get over that physical pain. You know, it's sort of a let out, let out your body. The tears seem to let it out. Um, It it was hard, but I decided, because one of the hardest things when somebody close to you has died, especially like Barry, because everybody knew he was my brother, we were close, we worked together, chuckle vision, um, all our lives working. Anybody who saw in the street or anywhere, the first thing to do straight up and say, no, I'm sorry about your brother. I really feel bad about your brother dying. And it's like when you're a child and you're running about and you trip over and bash your knee and you grit your teeth and look around. I hope nobody saw that. But then your mum picks you up and goes, oh, he's all right. Let them give you a hug. And straight away, you start crying. And straight away, when people come up and put their arm around you and say, sorry about your brother. Again, it chokes you up straight away. And it was happening all the time, obviously because I couldn't go anywhere without people saying sorry about your brother, which is nice, but it upsets you every time. So uh, me and Sue um, went to China, of all places, for two and a half weeks to get over it. And there wasn't one person we met out there that was from the UK. So not one person knew who I was, and not one person said, sorry about your brother, you know, which was a nice way to give me my own chance to grieve and enjoy his life, as we said about before, you know. I was just lay there thinking about all the time, good times we'd had on stage and, and everything. But that's another thing, that's the um, biggest thing I miss, is the fun we had working on stage. You know, it wasn't at all about the money. Of course, the money is always handy. You needed that. But it was, um, it was the fun we had, you know, the fun. Anybody who ever saw us working live, probably they all could see the fun we had on stage. You know, a drop of a hat, he could make me laugh and uh, vice versa. I'd make him laugh. The times we were working, both with tears in our eyes, you know, with laughter. That was the biggest thing I used to lay there and think about. I'm never going to have that anymore. You know, never again will we have that, that laughter together. I'm getting choked again now, talking about it. That's one of the things that you miss. Oh, yeah, it is. Certainly it is, yeah. Um, and it's when you think you're never, ever going to have that again, you know, no matter what. But you have to carry on life. Life goes on. That is what life is all about. I was just thinking when you were talking there, Paul, about that um, 
when you've been in the public eye, how lots of life events then become public. And so your grief and your loss when Barry died was public. And I think there's kind of pros and cons to that. And, um, you know, I've not really thought about that before, but when, you know, you're saying flying to China to just give yourself a bit of time to get your own head around it and think about your own loss and what it meant for you um, was really necessary. Okay, it was. I mean, even then, uh, we got to Heathrow and went through to sit before they let you on the, you know, through onto the plane. And uh, security guards were coming up and saying, oh, sorry about you, but I thought, oh, this is exactly what I'm trying to go away from. They're all coming up. Nice. You know, it's really nice for them to say. So is the reason is, we went over and it, it was good. It did get clear my head. You know, I was ready for it when I got back then. Straight away, people again, sorry to hear about your brother. Still do now. In fact, somebody I haven't met before, and say, no, I was really upset when your brother died. I'm so sorry. But, you, you know, it doesn't, doesn't upset you anymore because you, you've grieved. You've got it out of your system. Still miss him, as I've been saying all along. Miss him like mad, but... Um, it doesn't hurt anymore, you know. Were there other things, Paul, that helped with your grief? So, you know, the, there's there could be people listening, um, you know, to this today who are grieving themselves. And I just wondered whether there was any other things that helped you or have helped. Yeah, my wife and, and kids, you know, um, don't push them away. It's very easy to push your family away because, you know, they'll be, are you all right? And things like that. And it was so simple to say, no, leave me alone. Leave me alone, I'll be all right. But don't do that. Give them a hug, big hugs all the time. And cry with them, you know, cry together. That's the best thing I could say, really. Talk about it, talk to people, you know, like talk about good times. You know, yes, you'll never get the good times back, but your memories will always be there. You know, and just think it, it is part of life. You know, whether you die young, old, in the middle, whatever, that's part of it. We're born to live the best life we can. And just do that. Enjoy every minute of every day because it, it is a blessing to be here. You know, and even if you feel depressed and down, think, well, things could be worse. You know, things can only get better when you're grieving. It will get better. It's not, there's no medical cure to it. You know, it's a physical pain, it's an upsetting pain, you cry, you cry again and cry again, you can cry for days, but it's all getting it out of you. And again, think of the good times and talk to people, don't, don't take it on your own. You know, don't just mope about on your own. Whatever you do, don't be on your own. Always have somebody with you, you know. Do you think about your own death? Um, not really, because I, as I say, I, I take everything... Having said not really, I probably do, because I take every day as it comes. I do know there's an inevitability that one day I'm going to go. That's a, that's a certainty, not inevitability. It's a certainty that one day I will I'll go. Uh, I'm hoping to make a hundred. You know, I'd love to be a centurion. I'd love it. And uh, I just enjoy every single day. So when the time comes, I can't say, I wish I'd done this, I wish I'd done that. I do everything I can possibly do all the time. I do like a little tipple, more than I should. But as I say, you don't know how long you've got. I don't go on a bender. I don't do anything silly like that, drinking-wise. But I do like in the evening, I like to have a couple of drinks, you know, watching the telly or going out with friends and having a, a drink or a, a nice meal. You know, just live every day the best you can. So, as I say, I probably do think about it that way, uh, that I know I'm going to go, but it's not going to be yet. I live with the aches and pains of getting old. One of the aims for us with, with this podcast is to encourage people, you know, to have conversations with those around them about death and dying. Because what we know is when people plan for death, then there are often better outcomes. And so when I say plan, if people write down what their wishes are, where they might like to be cared for and or their funeral wishes and write a will, some of those things can be very helpful for those people who are left behind. And I wondered whether you'd 
planned anything? Well, yeah, I've been, uh, I, I made the wills out uh, many, many years ago when uh, the kids were very young. Um, so they're in place and obviously change it as time goes on, you know, different bits and pieces. So that, so we're all set. Um, the wife keeps saying she's going to bury me and I say, I will haunt you for everything you do. I, I want to be cremated. Uh, she knows that and I've even put it in the will now, you know, that I want to, just in case. Cause she, she said she wants to visit the grave. I said, you can have me on mantelpiece you know, at home. So again, that's talking about what you want in time. Yeah, it is. Why cremation? I've always had this fear of, you know, the old Middle Ages you used, used to have a bell. Some people were buried with a bell rope in case they came back to life because there's a sleeping death in there. You know, where heart stops, breathing stops, but they're not actually dead and they can come back to life, people. Dreaded the thought of being buried and dying of suffocation and whatever like that. And I thought, well, if I came back to life, it would be warm and I'd be gone in seconds. You know, it doesn't take long to cremate a body. Um, so that, that was always my thing. And just to say for anybody listening, that death verification processes nowadays are, are very robust. <laughs> yes. And um, it's interesting though, isn't it? Because I think, and that's part of having those conversations, because of course, not everybody wants the same things. And even in families and relationships, people might want different things. And as you say, your wife's saying, well, you know, I might want to go to visit the grave. And, you know, that would be helpful for me. And so I think, I think they're good conversations to have, aren't they? They certainly are, yeah. I mean, I've said to Sue, if she wants, she can cremate me and then bury me as well. I don't mind. Once I'm into ashes, there's no way I can come back to life. So you can put me in there and visit me as much as I like. Exactly. Some people do that. She could put me on a, a shelf in the corner and speak to me every day, you know. When we were first married, she would say, I won't let you go. So if you die, I'll have you sat in a seat and I'll tell compelled you down so you don't smell. <laughs> so I'm not going to tell anybody you've died because I don't want you to go. <laughs> she's changed her mind. 33 years later, I think she's changed her mind on that one. <laughs> <laughs> How nice. Can I ask, Paul, how would you like to be remembered? Um, just a nice person. Uh, I've always tried to be nice to anybody and everybody. Um, funny double act, obviously, with Barry. And apart from that, it, whatever people want, <laughs> whatever they think of me. I mean, because you can't, you know, although Chuckle Vision was very, very popular um, for all the years it was on, 23 years, you still know you're not entertaining 100% of the people because everybody's got different tastes and different thoughts. Most people seem to love it. But there are a couple of people that say, oh, I couldn't be bothered watching that, you know. It's fair enough, you know, because everybody's different. Aren't they? You know, we're all different, you know. Just before we finish, if there's anyone listening who is either grieving or is caring for someone at the minute who's dying, do you have any words or thoughts from your experience that you want to share? Well, uh, yes, um, obviously be there for the person and have someone there for yourself as well at the same time. Um, and if they're getting close to the end, that you, you're with somebody close to the end, chat to them, you know, as normally as you can, but don't make them think you're not going. You know, they know, people know that they're, they're dying and they're passing away. Give them comfort chat to them about all sorts of stuff and, and be there for them. And I say, and it's the same if you know somebody who's caring for someone, be there for them as well, because it's the pain, it's, it hurts. It really does hurt. And uh, you've got to appreciate the fact that someone who's caring for someone who's dying needs that hand around their shoulder, you know, cuddle now and again, and being there talking to them as well because it's depressing as well as anything else you know as well as upsetting it's just depression you can't get away from that and you do need to talk to them and help them and if you are the one caring just find people to talk to about your loved one you know 
Thank you. And Paul, thank you for joining us today on the Marie Curie Couch and sharing your story and some of Barry's story as well. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Pleasure. So that's all for this episode of On the Marie Curie Couch. We hope it's got you thinking about matters of life and death and perhaps starting those conversations with your own friends and family. Marie Curie's here to help. From planning ahead to coping with bereavement, you can talk through any concerns you have around the end of life with our support line team, which also includes specially trained nurses. Call us on 0800 090 2309 or search Marie Curie online. This podcast is made by Marie Curie, a national charity that supports people affected by terminal illness. For more information and support, you can visit our website, mariecurie.org.uk. The podcast is produced and edited by Marie Curie with support from Ultimate Sound and Vision. The music featured is Time Lapse by Pan Oceanic. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please do like and subscribe. Thanks for listening, and until next time, goodbye.